Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Footnoting History, where Christine and I are back again with the hosts of Pod Academy, this time discussing Dr. Zhivago and the Last Emperor. Stay tuned to learn more here on Footnoting History. Welcome to part two of our discussion about revolutionary movies with the hosts of Pod Academy. This week from our footnoting history team, you again have Elizabeth, me, and Christine, and we are super happy to be here, even though, again, kind of nervous because we are off script. In our previous podcast about revolutions depicted in movies, we talked about The Patriot and Les Le Miserables and The American Revolution and The French Revolutions, respectively. So, as we discussed, these movies were made from the point of view of the revolutionaries, the disenfranchised, we failed for them and their cause. Well, now that, we, that we've arrived at the 1965 movie Dr. Zhivago, the most famous movie about the Russian Revolution, the movie is no longer sympathetic to the plight of the poor, the disenfranchised, and the destitute. Dr. Zhivago is not even directly anti-revolutionary, it's more like uh, meh revolutionary or uh, revolutionary, but the fact that it leaves on the viewers a sense that it would have been better for everyone had the people of Russia just uh, stayed put, stayed silent, not demanded change, uh, that rubbed me the wrong way. That things were okay before they came in with their big ideas and their dirty, and their dirty ignorant peasants. Uh, so the movie starts and ends in 1950s uh, USSR saying to us, in my eyes, see what you've done? Are you happy now? Is that better? And I want to, and I want to push back on that. Uh, Dr. Zhivago, so that's a 1965 British-Italian movie based on a 1957 Russian novel by uh, Boris Pasternak. And it's not even a historical epic, it's a romantic epic about uh, Yuri Zhivago, a Moscow doctor and poet, and Lara, a young woman. And at the center of the drama are their trials and tribulations, pursuing their love as they find themselves in unhealthy romantic relationships, or just merely unsatisfying relationships. That's the core of the drama of the movie. And as a backdrop, there are less important events like the First World War, the Russian Revolution, the fall of the Tsarist regime, the civil war, the subsequent uh, rise of the Bolsheviks, who later established the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, more commonly known as the USSR. So it seems that this point of view was very popular in the West, and I was surprised to learn that this movie was one of the highest grossing movies of all time, adjusted for inflation. I was less surprised, though, to learn that this movie was used by the CIA as an anti-communist propaganda tool during the heyday of the Cold War. As the world is burning and the tides of history are forever changing, Russia and the world, the point of view of this movie is the personal angst of a petit bourgeois doctor who is, cute dramatic drum roll, is attracted to a woman who is not his wife. Mm. Mm -hmm. <gasps> <laughs> dun dun dun! <laughs> Uh, so, so the various relationships between the characters, they get ample screen time. And there's not a lot of time left over to go over the underlying reasons for this Russian revolution. The many revolts, the strikes, the protests, alignments and realignments. We have to remember that when the movie came out in 1965, it was three years after the Cuban Missile Crisis. So moviegoers knew coming in that the rates were bad. So better not complicate things too much. Please don't have sympathetic characters like uh, Fantine or Gavroche from Les Miserables. And let's stick to unsmiling Bolshevik soldiers and dirty poor workers who now feel entitled to make decisions. And this comes in direct contrast with the life that we see at the beginning of the movie from the standpoint of the bourgeoisie of Moscow. It is fun, they eat, they dance, they have affairs, they write poetry. Then these red Bolsheviks come in and everything turns to shit. The production value was impressive, showing us the pre-revolutionary Moscow elite with their fascination with France and the French, their lifestyle and all. But it's pretty disconcerting that the story and the characters are not interested in making sense of the events that are rocking their worlds. Why did all this happen? Uh, I don't know. It's mostly the lives of the bourgeois heroes that get steadily worse 
as the Bolsheviks gain in power. So bourgeois good, Bolsheviks bad. These Bolsheviks, they take private property. Ah, they force the good doctor to come with them and treat soldiers as the civil war is raging around them, which sounds like the libertarian nightmare depiction of a public health system. They'll force the doctors to work. Ah. <laughs> The most uh, sympathetic scene of the Bolsheviks is when they protest under the slogan Bread and Peace, to which Dr. Zhivago gives an ironic support, and then the police run them down. But Bread and Peace, come on. When you watch the movie, it seems disingenuous. You can't judge the common people of the time for the collapse of the world around them and the chess game of geopolitics, which later brought the civil war and famine and Stalin and purges. There was a political context, and it's not like the British were the good guys. But in Dr. Zhivago, the absence of the white nationalists from the movie, as everything is crumbling down, gives the sense that the Reds are the bad guys. The heroes don't even complain too much about the fact that the Reds now house 20 people in their three-storied house smack dab in the center of Moscow. They don't mind that much because they can get to their winter mini castle. And when the winter mini castle is uh, boarded, well, they have another house right there. In reality, the Russian society was worthy of a revolution with quasi slaves, meaning serfs, an, unele an unelected monarch, the Tsar, a do nothing elite that do not work, and landowners who control the economy with an iron grip. We don't expect the 99% to just accept all this lying down because after a bloody civil war with nationalists, then Stalin took power. And what would have happened had the nationalists won the war? Russia would still have been decimated by the First World War and the Civil War, and, the Civil war, and it's very likely would have turned out not too different from other European countries under the yoke of a nationalist regime, like Italy, Spain, or hmm, Germany. The Russian nationalists were no less anti-Semitic than the German counterparts, responsible for countless of pogroms over the decades which is part of the reason for the Jewish immigration to the U.S. at the turn of the 20th century. And in nearby Finland, there was a similar civil war that ended with mass atrocities committed by nationalists. And the Germans and the British were actively supporting the Russian nationalists. So for the common people, this was a war of survival, not to maintain their privileges. Case in point, the rack and file were on the red hand made up of soldiers and on the white hand made up of rich officers. So unfortunately, Dr. Zhivago spends zero screen time explaining the causes of World War I, a family feud that destroyed the lives of millions who had no bone to pick with the other common people they were fighting against. Zero screen time for the harsh economic conditions of the vast majority of the country. The movie doesn't show us anything bad the white nationalist armies do during the Civil War. It's as if it's a one-sided crusade that the Reds are fighting and for no good reason. So this is a petit bourgeois story about a poet in love. He was happy and content and other people come in and ruin his plans on a good life. Why on earth would they want to revolt? Things are going swimmingly, according to Dr. Zhivago. So Fantini is becoming a prostitute to pay for her daughter to live. Well, it's either that or Stalin. That's what I feel Dr. Zhivago is telling us. Or maybe wait a few years or generations and the benevolent landowners would have enacted just reforms for everyone. Because when we look at the world even today, of course, all we see are powerful people racing to change things for the better for the 99%, even if it means having a million or a billion less, <laughs> right? So that's my beef with Dr. Zhivago. It makes it seem that an authoritarian communist regime was the inevitable result of an ideological crusade and not the result of an incredibly complex number of political and geopolitical processes, internal pressures and foreign involvement that led the world in that path. By the way, Russia now today has a nationalist regime with President Vladimir Putin. How is that working out? Okay, so let's open this up for discussion. Tell me what you think <laughs> <laughs> well then i had a beef <laughs> you definitely held back mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was a good movie well i think one of the things though like the the, the bolsheviks 
were not at all inevitable even when revolution started you know like uh, if the if the Mensheviks had had a chance and if there hadn't been you know uh, pushback from the whites and also from by the way foreign expeditions right like uh, there was actually uh, armies of other countries mm -hmm. fighting against the revolution there was the Czechs there was I think uh, British expeditionary forces and, and whatnot uh, maybe if there hadn't been that much pushback, that it it could have evolved more in kind of a social democratic yeah. direction and not the radicalization of the Bolsheviks yeah. in the end. Mm -hmm. Right. And even that um, to bring in the geopolitical context in World War One that you were mentioning, I mean Germany is the reason Lenin comes back, right? Because they pay for that. So yeah, it's this very, it's it's these pieces moving on a chessboard, but that doesn't, as you pointed out, mean that everything was like hunky dory and wonderful. For the people, the peasants living in Russia prior to yeah, to that experience, definitely. Like I, I would have been pro revolution. <laughs> I I have nothing good to say about the USSR or Stalin, obviously, but uh, it just it is a, like a it's a Cold War product. I felt like uh, it was lacking lacking in context uh, in context and history, and uh, I, I feel like I could have enjoyed it more because other pieces were there acting. And scenery mm -hmm. and all that. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that uh, has been, you know, inserted into the movie uh, at, at, at <laughs> something that just triggered me, uh, kind of after the fact. Like, do you guys know the TV no. series Allo Allo, this British comedy series? Yeah. Oh, I do uh, not. Uh, yeah, it's it's about ah. occupied France, and it's it's a sitcom right. <laughs> essentially, right. a sitcom with the Nazis, and there. There is um, Herr Flick of the Gestapo, and yeah, and Strelnikov totally reminds me of Herr Flick of the Gestapo. Like he's got the, the long leather jacket and like the little round glasses, and he's very sort of cold. Like when there's mm. the interrogation in the armored train, it totally reminds me of. Okay, we're mm. supposed to maybe think also a little mm. bit about the Nazis. Like uh, you know, the, the, these Bolsheviks are very, very militant very intolerant and they just uh, you know subject you to a very hard uh, interrogation because they're just cold like that you know mm -hmm. hmm. uh, Rutger, remember uh, when we talked about the movie 1917 they depict like there were two interactions between uh, British soldiers and German soldiers and the German soldiers were violent and kind of like without even logic just like really fervent we had this zeal and this goes counter into the major themes that we know about world war one and for me for us it was obvious that this is the result of we know what happened later mm -hmm. in world war ii that the germans became the bad guys so now it's harder to look, even to portray them differently in world war one and that's in contrast with the movie uh, between the wars uh, no news from the western front that was made in uh, 29 and there the germans it's an american movie or based on a german uh, book mm -hmm. and there the germans are totally sympathetic and you are totally with them so that was kind of uh, that was kind of the thing for me yeah i love all quiet on the western front <laughs> all quiet sorry in hebrew i translated from the hebrew translation all quiet in hebrew it's no news it's okay there are a thousand different languages to translate it into it was interesting um what you said in the little opening monologue about what you wish they had sh so my experience with dr zhivago as i told you guys before we started recording was just a musical version of it but right before i started watching the movie this time um i was reading simultaneously two different books about the actress natalie wood and her her parents came over as a result to came over to the United States as a result of the Russian Revolution. So I was reading about these people on the ground and, and this family who, you know, they were not a family by before they came over, they met here. But the two sides of her family that eventually went from uh, what was then Russia into yeah. China and then through China to California and Canada and US and all those North American areas. And then I watched the movie and I said to myself, okay, so I just really like that these are people who were living their lives and this stuff yeah. was happening to them, right? Like we get a lot of, a lot of like in Lehman is it's the students yeah. who are throwing this, you know, having this revolution and then the Patriot, he's actively, um, you know, partaking in this event. 
and even in which we're not up to yet the last emperor like he's in the forbidden city and the things are happening yeah. kind of outside of yeah. him but this is the one where we see the people who the things are happening to the most um no they're not involved in it and like it would be kind of cool to see the, the mechanisms behind it and how it all got to happen but it's kind of interesting because if you really think about it the majority of the population is having it happen to them right so even though these are not real people i mean unless i missed something and dr Zhivago was like actually yeah. a real human um which he may have been and we just don't know you yeah. never know uh but yeah i like that um aspect of it because mm. it was a cool as a storytelling tool right it was cool like the the scene where he comes back and he just finds out that his house is no longer really his house anymore was to me like the biggest most like yeah. oh my gosh moment because that's when you everything gets real and we talked about this last time with like when it becomes personal mm -hmm. and there are obviously things where it becomes personal for him before that you know throughout the movie but like that's when it really literally hits home he comes home and he's like oh right so this is like not only happening but it's literally taking over every aspect of my life at this point and not all of us <laughs> would have many multiple houses that we can yeah. just go to <laughs> but i remember that, when i was watching the movie that was the scene where i kind of just went oh, okay this is getting real personal right now you know well this this is the point where i'm really really getting inconvenienced by this revolution that's 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 going on well right exactly <laughs> it's like now i really have to have a super opinion because i don't even have my own bedroom anymore you know he, th he thinks he's coming home right and it's all like over quotations over you know he's coming home he's gonna be reunited with his like cushy house and be happy and then he walks in and he's like what is going on how many families are in this house and what do we do about it he's pretty cavalier about it that was kind of surprising yeah. like they were like haha this is an experience <laughs> that was yeah, weird i mean I, it was weird i was watching it i thought to myself well maybe he's just saying that so they don't kill him for objecting mm. right like if, if he comes home and he's like F you, please get out of my house. I really don't know that that would have ended well for him. Well, I, th I think that part, <laughs> that, that scene actually, I, I really liked in the sense that it seemed like kind of real that like, probably when you enter into a situation like that, yeah, at first you're just flabbergasted, like, okay, so right. the house <laughs> right. is full mm -hmm. and there's now these commissars who are telling me that now it's finally time to start working and like you're right. part of the house. I think the, f the first couple of minutes, probably all you can do is kind of laugh, like, okay, what's, what's right. happening here? Right. And then, yeah. you know, uh, gradually the reality sink sinks in and gradually you also see that, you know, now the shoe is on the other foot and maybe if I make a problem, there's the bullet for me. So right. let's just go right. along. Mm. Um, it's definitely a very human scene. I kind of had an experience. I kind of had an experience kind of similar to, to that. It's a... Uh, it's a weird build up, but uh, let's hope there's a payoff at the end. So when I was uh, traveling in India, one of the times that I was traveling in India, uh, I was on a night bus and you had like, you have all like the regular seats and then you have like beds uh, on top for uh, tourists and uh, rich Indians. And I don't know if you've been to India, but let's say that there's always like overcapacity on trains and buses and everything. And then along uh, along the way, uh, like the night uh, night route, they stop whatever three a.m. four a.m. and then you go you go to the bathroom, you, you order some chai, something like that. So I went down, and then first of all, I open the window and I see the masses below me, and that's already like a very uncomfortable uh, situation. You're like, wow, I'm like mega super ultra rich here. Like they're all crammed all over each other. I step over them like they're sleeping. I go out and when I come back, apparently they thought that I would not come back. And they were like sleeping in my bed and climbing together. And I came and I was like, <laughs> like Dr. Zhivago, <laughs> I wasn't laughing. <laughs> and uh, so that's, I, I would have thought that he would have reacted the, the opposite way. Just like, what the hell is going on okay so we don't have like politically we can empathize with the the, the, the poor people and the destitute but this is a, a human emotion you come there he, he's not a bad guy he has good intentions he comes in he sees his house he's taken over doesn't uh, protest even a little just like whatever just to see okay maybe i should accept it because uh, they will kill me just immediately it was <laughs> i don't know that was weird 
Yeah, that was weird for me. I think me. I would. I think the you know, the main difference there is that they probably weren't going to kill you for objecting <laughs> want, on, yeah. on the night bus. Mm-hmm. Like, they were I think not. <laughs> if I had walked into the house in his situation, I probably would have been like, mm-hmm. yeah. "Just tell me where to go. Like, just just don't hurt me and and let me." Because that's when yeah. you know that they're really coming for you. Yeah. I didn't lose a war before. I didn't lose a war from when I left the the, the my the bus and come back. Had I lost the war, <laughs> well, yeah, that I would have been. It was, you know, a little, a little tough on. One of the things that I really loved it though with in the house, like okay, so he goes in and not only is it divided up, you can see that it's already being torn right. to shreds. It's all dark uh, and gross. And and yeah, and you can kind of see between a couple of scenes. There's like the rails of the mm-hmm. stairs, which is all wooden. And from one scene to the next, you can see there's more wood been taken right. out. Yeah, as fuel. it's getting torn down. <laughs> it's very subtle. Like you see, like they're slowly burning up the furniture and the house. And uh, then he also goes looking for wood elsewhere in the city. And right. That's when his his brother first see him. So there's like this gradual, like uh, all of the things that have been built up are gradually just being consumed and, and burnt up and, and yeah, um, used up, basically. To just build upon that whole concept of like who this movie is about, and it is, it's the petite bourgeoisie, right? And it's not necessarily their revolution or it's not their revolution at all. And it's kind of like, so when we talked about the Patriot last week and we said that like a third of American colonists supported the revolution, a third were loyalists and a third didn't really care, right? So this is kind of like the movie about the group that was like not super invested politically either way. Um, and it's the same thing with when we talked about Les Mis last week when people went out for Lamarck's funeral and everything, but then they don't show up to the revolution because, you know, various things. And so, yeah, we are, like Christine was saying, we're getting this glimpse into the lives of the non-revolutionaries. And although I agree that it it lacks anything to do with why the revolution happened, probably because Boris Pasternak was not a fan of the revolution, which is why he smuggles this book out. But it is, it's that weird thing where we're looking at the group who don't really care because it hasn't been so negative for them. And now, now it has become negative. And so that's, you know. I love that. Oh, I, I love that because it's like, for many people, it just becomes a survival story, right? Like, weather the sea change and, and hope that you're mm-hmm. going to get through it. Yeah. And you don't see that that often. It's usually either like, these people are so great and they won, or, oh my gosh, here's the tragedy of the, the defeat. Mm-hmm. And this is the group that's kind of like, how am I going to just get through whatever this is and kind of make it to the other side with some aspect of my before life still intact? You yeah. know, mm-hmm. right or wrong, That's that's just another angle that i find really interesting yeah. to to look yeah, at right. yeah. even if I- yeah he's also he's not he's i mean he's not anti-revolutionary yeah. he's he kind of likes the ideas he's kind right. of i guess he would have been like a liberal at the time right. and yeah bread and peace that's mm-hmm. nice yeah. yeah that's nice let's all get along yeah. uh, you know go along to get he's, along It'll he's be just fine. not you know beating his chest and like running down to he's not pasha right mm-hmm. who so, i love mm. i love because i love any origin story for a villain <laughs> <laughs> so Christy to your point and I think we talked about it also in the last podcast also, actually Elizabeth you, you also j- just mentioned it like today this mm-hmm. movie would have been made differently uh, even, if you, even mm-hmm. if, you, if you would have taken the same story the same right. book because you would mm-hmm. want because now it's relevant what was the political context and the fact that it was so successful at the time tells us maybe as much about the time than about the story because uh, you are both right there's a value in hearing this kind of story from this kind of person that this impact this way it's not something that is no not worth uh, creating uh, a movie about definitely have any of you read the book because oh, i want to know if the framework that the way they frame it with the like guy looking for the the who he believes is his niece is that in the book or is that a device for the movie i honestly don't know all right um if anybody sees me using my phone i'm looking it up okay i i do want to add that when christine watched this movie the text i received from her was like what's wrong with his wife his wife is fine i like like right right? like she was like i don't understand what's so great about that and that was like the text message chain that i received just to add a moment of levity in the middle of our revolutions (laughs) and downtrodden well no it was true because i I kept thinking to myself i don't get it like i don't and, and I know that's like, I'm going to probably get hate mail now again, because it's supposed to be this like epic 
like love story that happens in the middle of this war situation and i'm sitting there going but nothing really causes me to feel that he should be yeah. turning away from his wife because she's kind of yeah. a really good person and she stays yeah. with him through like all yeah. the nonsense that happens. Yeah, oh, they, they should have just stayed in the Dutch, uh, uh, him and Antonia, mm -hmm. and just grown potatoes right. and lived their like, lives. Why are you going into town and uh, we, go we uh, look for Lara? Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you could have like ended the movie at intermission. Right. And it would have just been like, and then they stayed as potato farmers. Exactly. <laughs> and they lived happily mm -hmm. ever, ever after, uh, ever after uh, on the Russian countryside. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah his, his wife even, even seems mm -hmm. more interesting than Lara. Like, they didn't spend a, lo a lot of time to making, uh, right. except, you know, Shasta shows us, okay, she, so she's beautiful. Mm -hmm. But he goes into such lengths yeah. for her and falls so, so much in love with her in a way. And she's 18 mm -hmm. at the time when yeah. they meet, 17. Yeah, that was like, uh, it's as if a story that's, it's like yeah, a fairy tale, like know, a fairy tale. Fine, life. but like, mm -hmm. it's not like, it's yeah. not like, I guess I just had a hard time that's kind okay. of pulling it for them. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I was like, why, why am I, why? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I was really like, I was really texting her saying like, <laughs> so I'm watching Dr. Zhivago and I just, yeah. I don't think I love them together yep. as much as I'm supposed to, mm -hmm. because I can't find anything wrong with Tanya. Tanya, that's the wife's name, right? And I'm going, she's not horrible to him. Now, Pasha, okay, like, he becomes really evil. But, mm -hmm. like, in the beginning mm -hmm. of the movie, he's not so bad. You know? And, which, again, is why I find him interesting. Because I like to see how somebody who, from the film, at least, I haven't, like I said, I haven't read the book, film's perspective, become goes from being somebody who completely just buys into this um revolution so much to then ultimately become so corrupted essentially by it that he becomes the villain of the story um and that's really cool mm -hmm. because everybody else seems to kind of stay almost static in their opinions of what's going on um <laughs> and i'm not saying i agree with how he goes in his life because i don't i've i had a conversation this weekend that somebody took the fact that i said something was an interesting <laughs> historical period to mean that i agreed with what happened during it and that is not the same thing um mm -hmm. saying no. that mm -hmm. you find something <laughs> fascinating does not necessarily mean that you're co-signing what the person did um yeah. so <laughs> Right. right. Yeah. I guess we're like, too I was boring. like, if we think that all historians who study their periods uh, agree with what happened in them, we have some big conversations to be having. Um, but <laughs> it was interesting to me to see that, you know, the person who buys the most into this revolution is the one who ultimately becomes a bad guy. I was like, Liz, I don't understand the whole Lara thing. And also, mm -hmm. this does not oh, yeah. make people mm -hmm. who are pro-revolution look very good. Uh, but what you, yeah, to your point about the other people being maybe a little bit static, like I, I thought it was also like the character of, you know, Obi-Wan <laughs> Kenobi, uh, Yevkav, who, who sort of, he starts out as a cop and he rises through the ranks a little bit, <laughs> mm -hmm. but he's basically unchanged throughout, mm -hmm. you know, almost uh, no, more than 50 years of, of uh, Soviet life and turmoil and, and all the rest. And he kind of has this vague, vaguely yeah. ironic smile on his face. And he's, he's kind of nice to everyone, even though I guess with the blue, he's NKVD or whatever he is. Uh, that, that's kind of weird mm -hmm. also. He has no character development really. Yeah, he's kind of intimidating, mm -hmm. but it's not really clear why. Yeah. Yeah, everybody's scared of him. So now I feel like we all need to read Dr. Zhivago because I'm like, was it just this really bad translation to the screen or was everybody lacking nuance except Pasha like what happened in this in this book no it's not clear is there any character development at all although I think it's really long so there's that <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the I think the book is long is it though I don't know I don't know I know you're googling oh. that um I'm mm. looking I'm trying to find out <laughs> according to this they they do have in the book the bit about uh, thinking that she must be the, the girl must be the daughter. Uh, okay. That is in the in the book. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's it's weird that in a time where everything changed over and over and over, and then this, there's this great line. I don't have it in mm -hmm. front of me, but it's something along the lines of, uh, "I wish this band of hooligans, this or that band of hooligans, uh, will decide already who is in charge." This is a great uh, uh, way to describe governments uh, everywhere. So, I got what was my point? I got derailed myself. Where did I start? Well, based on mm -hmm. what you said, I think that revolution fatigue is a very real thing. You know, people start sure. off 
yeah. you know, either very pro or very anti or as Liz was saying, not caring. But eventually mm-hmm. you get to a point where it's like, can we just figure out what's mm-hmm. going to happen next? Because yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. And you have to. Yeah. At first, it's really mm-hmm. exciting that it's now it is now Brumaire instead of the old yeah, month's yeah, names. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then after a while, you're still <laughs> not used to it. Like what? What day is it today again? <laughs> <I> <laughs> when know, is the market? We you know? <laughs> yeah, we actually have that here now. There's a there's a political plan, whatever, by the Israeli government, the right wing government, to annex parts of the West Bank, and the Palestinian Authority was banking on having people in the street and demonstrating against that to whatever have pressure like uh, on the global on the international community and all that. Two hundred mm-hmm. people, two hundred Palestinians mm-hmm. showed up for this protest. Right. Even they mm-hmm. just everybody's so tired, it's like oh whatever yeah and whatever I, I definitely think that you see that in this a little bit you know because he i feel bad saying that nobody had an opinion change or that they were static because i'm sh- there were subtle things about it but it's not like a dramatic sort of you know oh my gosh here we are we're so passionate this whole time it definitely does become like a all right let's just put our heads down and hope this ends soon and and we all get through it and we're here on the other side together and I might have my girlfriend on the side too, and we should all really like that because the music is cool. Like I don't know, that's, that's how it seems at some point. Like the, the lush mm. score and the sweeping epic nature. Like how do you adapt that from novel to screen to yeah. to stage? And it, it's true because visually, like Russia becomes a character. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, mm-hmm. you, you get to see the city versus the countryside, and and what war does to all these places, and how the places get boarded up, right? Because they get taken over, even in the countryside, and the only place that's left is the little shack. Mm-hmm. You know, and you, you, it's a pretty it's like, big shack from the inside. It's pretty. It big. is a. It's, it's <laughs> like it's like the TARDIS. It's, it's like the, oh, I was about to say it's like Doctor Who. Uh, I thought that <laughs> like so in, there we uh, go. in Harry Potter, they also have this uh, like these tents. When you come in, it's uh, very big. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's bigger on but the inside, right? That's right. You were, uh, when we were mm-hmm. talking about this uh, earlier, you said uh, something about the uh, spaghetti western, right? Because it's a uh, it's an Italian movie. So actually, that speaks to to the points that you just uh, talked about now. One major theme. Of, uh, of these spaghetti westerns is just like the the person the soul person like in front of the of nature and the and mm-hmm. the wheels of history everything is changing and he starts is he's, he's, he's right there and it kind of fits uh, the themes mm-hmm. in this movie like uh, the, the revolution and all and then the the civil war it's like a force of nature that just happens and he just needs to weather mm-hmm. the storm just weather the storm right. come back and then at the end also Moscow looks kind of regular like you wouldn't know that anything happened really right. when he walks on the street yep. and sees uh, maybe Lara and the fact that they end on that and not and even skip over the resolution of the civil war and, the, the, and all that just like it it ends on the personal note highlights that this is just right. a, a story about a guy who likes a girl even though he's married yeah I mean, it is cool, even because mm-hmm. I'm going to keep bringing up Pasha because I do like him. <laughs> you, but once he become, once you find out that he's the evil guy at the end, right before the intermission, like you almost never see him again. I mean, you do see him again, but like compared to what you would think, like in Les Mis, right? Javert keeps popping back up like over and over and over again. Yeah. In the Patriot, they're perpetually mm-hmm. fighting the enemy. Lucius Malfoy right. is constantly right. he's in, in there. the Patriot yeah. all the time. I'm just in, yeah, in uh, this movie, it's like we get the like realization that that's you know who this evil person is that they're talking about is like riding on the train and whatever we figure it out and then it's like okay but he's just kind of hovering in the background and very rarely on the screen for the whole second half yeah and he he, he uses his uh, original name so which which is kind right. of okay kind of an interesting part about these revolutions is that people use all these pseudonyms and stuff and of course right. that used happened during the russian revolution enormously as well lenin and stalin and then molotov and all the rest and he becomes you know strelnikov but then when he's captured on the way to the dacha he just has his original name and you know basically oh i'm the husband of lara and i'm, I'm right. going to meet my wife and then he's he, then they catch him I see. right mm-hmm. yeah no I, I thought that was interesting how little you do see him for him being this like kind of yeah but he's kind of enemy. also the symbol of this this looming system that gets right. more and more exactly. oppre- oppressive because they also some, sometimes they show these photos of first lenin right. and trotsky and then later in the last shot of lara 
when they say, oh, she probably was on one of the lists and the list was mislaid and she disappeared. And then you see her walking away in this big yes. photo of Stalin. Of, oh, right, this, Stalin. Is the purges, yeah. this is mm-hmm. this whole system just gets more and more oppressive and murderous. And, and, and Pasha is kind of just yeah. a you know the the manifestation of that in a single person but right which is cool i think that's a, a mm-hmm. really interesting way to do it as opposed to just having him like literally sitting there causing people problems <laughs> constantly because <laughs> yeah. a lot of times you know sometimes the threat is worse than the confrontation yeah that's very true yeah mm-hmm. by the way the book is apparently 600 pages so okay so you can read it elizabeth and then you'll just uh, yeah i'll give you know. the cliff notes yep i'll uh yes. we, i'll <laughs> run it through mm-hmm. well what i'm kind of curious about is uh t- the the extent to which the slant is also kind of different in the book because it was published in in italy by feltrinelli right who okay that was mm-hmm. kind of a fancy family at first but i think he kind of became a, a left wing it's a bookstore that's like that, that still exists in italy right there's a couple of feltrinelli shops mm-hmm. and and i think he he wasn't when he decided to publish it it, it wasn't because oh i'm a you know a convinced anti-communist and we'll get those reds when we publish this book so I don't know if, if there's a difference in that sense also between how it's depicted mm-hmm. on screen versus right. how it's actually written. Like on those 600 pages, if uh, you know there's uh, 50 pages of exploitation about uh, the plight of the serfs and uh, how terrible they were suffering, well, that makes that really right. changes mm-hmm. the angle uh, right there, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, right. absolutely. And apparently, um, Dr. Zhivago is also now part of the Russia school curriculum. So all the equivalent, so of 11th grade, so around like age 16 or 17, it is now, that's one of the books that students in Russia read. Of course, because they're now in favor of the (laughs) Right, so it's like, the Tsar died. (laughs) This is so sad, October Revolution. I think that's the same year. I think 11th grade is the same year that I read All Quiet on the Western Front. You know, I've never read All Quiet on the Western Front. Oh. (gasps) <gasps> I know. Sorry. <laughs> my, my gasp of horror. It's, uh, it's, I know. Yeah, much, it's, it's short. much shorter than that. <laughs> it's, short, it's, uh, it's not. It, I think it's not even 200 right, pages. I think it's like 100 and something. Oh, you, you would like it, I think. Being yeah. Liz really loves yeah, World War yeah. I. Yeah, it's like my second favorite war right after mm. the Crimean. Mm. Go with that. <laughs> and now that, that you we're have going to get wars. about me comparing the Crimean to be my favorite war. <laughs> <laughs> favorite wars you're like you're like dick cheney what uh what, what are the favorite wars right when the sasha baron cohen interviewed him yeah <laughs> that's the thing you say favorite and people come down like did you agree with when that person did such and such and you're like no it just means i really find like learning about how it all worked really no, no you say favorite it's on tape it's on tape <laughs> As Christine said, it doesn't mean I support the war or anything. I just find it fascinating. <laughs> oh, I text Liz during that movie too, and my texts were for, my texts during that movie were nobody looks good by the end of this. <laughs> I agree. Nobody does. That is true in any revolution. Nobody. But that's but that's probably that's probably the most honest like answer, right? Though at the end of the revolution, nobody comes out looking clean. Right. Whereas in all the other movies we've talked about, there's like obviously that that bias to try and make somebody look good. And in this one, it's like, yeah, that did not work. But anyway, OK. Yeah. Outre, outre Tell you, us about okay, China, try please. to make your, mm-hmm. make your case, make your case. Why is this one different? I'll try to set the states a little bit here. So here we go. Yeah, so you know how like in, in Chinese political discourse, there's this habit that they have of making little lists of things and they're good or bad or desirable. So, for example, there was the big revolution in 1911 that turned China into a republic. And that was inspired by the three principles of the people, nationalism, democracy and livelihood. And then later on, uh, you know, by the end of the movie, there's the Cultural Revolution. And there was, you know, there the four olds needed to be destroyed. The old customs, the old culture, old habits and old ideas. And now to set up this final film, uh, we can also add the three myths of Chinese expression. So the first myth here that I want to talk about is about this statement that was supposedly made by the foreign minister under Mao, Zhou Enlai, when Nixon visited China in the early 70s. And then when he was asked what the impact was of the French Revolution, he's supposed to have said, oh, it's too early to say. Now, the story is a myth because it was based on a misunderstanding. Joe thought he was being asked about the student protests in Paris in 68. 
And indeed, it was too early to say. The Soissons retards had barely started their long march through the institutions at that point. And no doubt, even in the supposed long-term vision of the Chinese, the French republicanism that finds its roots in 1789 had become irreversible by the 1970s. But the anecdote does raise the question of what the lasting impact is of revolutions on the people that live through them and the generations that follow. Bliss it was in that dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven, wrote Wordsworth about the French Revolution. Well, maybe it was, but it was definitely interesting times. Which takes us to the second myth. We in the West think that there's a Chinese curse that goes, may you live in interesting time. In interesting times. There is no such curse, but we all do get to point. It might be better to live in times with little upheaval, uninteresting times. And the third myth is about Chinese writing. Business leaders and motivational speakers like to say that the Chinese character for the word crisis are actually the combination of danger and opportunity. Again, it's not really true, it's mistranslations, but the myths do lead us to the protagonist of our final film, The Last Emperor. The main character of the film is Pu Yi, the final ruler of the Qing dynasty, who lived through very interesting times, full of danger and opportunity, and whose lasting impacts we might not be able to tell yet. But to understand what the movie is about, we probably need to fill in some facts. Most of our audiences live in the West, and we probably haven't had a lot of education in Chinese history, or geography, so let's do a quick crash course. China is a massive place on the eastern end of Eurasia, which I guess we all know. <laughs> it's been ruled for millennia by different dynasties. For example, over the last thousand years, there's been the Song dynasty, pretty much during the high middle ages in Europe. Then the Mongols appeared and started making trouble for everyone in Eastern Europe, the Middle East, Japan, and also China. Under Kublai Khan, they instil installed themselves as emperors, founding the Yuan dynasty, which lasted roughly till the Black Death in Europe, the mid-1300s. The Yuan dynasty was replaced by the Ming, which ruled during what's the Renaissance for us. And the final dynasty to appear was the Qing, which replaced the Ming in the mid-1600s and lasted until Puyi. These dynasties were not necessarily royal families. Instead, they were different types of social orders with different cultural sensibilities. They ruled because they had acquired the mandate of heaven, which you might compare with the European divine right of kings. A dynasty might lose the mandate because of externalities that were seen as signs, such as natural disasters or famines, or because their subjects lost confidence in them. The Qing rose against the Ming because they had grown resentful and had compiled another one of those lists, the seven grievances of the Qing. This is a bit like documents such as the Dutch Act of Abjuration against Philip II or the US Declaration of Independence against George III. The dynasties ruled over an empire, which doesn't just mean that China is a massive place, but like all empires, it's an amalgamation of different peoples. In China, five main ethnic groups are historically recognized as the big ones. There's the Han, the largest group who we most closely identify with Chinese culture and with the plain of the Yellow River, one of the early centers of agriculture. Then there's the Mongols from the steppes, who were, and often still are, nomads on horseback. On the southwest of China are the Tibetans, at the high altitudes of the Tibetan Plateau. In the far west are the Hui, which is kind of shorthand for the Muslim Chinese. And in the northeast, wedged between Mongolia and Korea, are the Manchu. Each of the Chinese dynasties was somewhat aligned with one of these groups. For example, the Song of the High Middle Ages were more or less Han. They made some of the significant Chinese inventions we've heard about, such as woodblock printing presses, gunpowder, and paper money. The Yuan were Mongols, but they became culturally more Chinese very quickly. The Ming were Han. We probably know them from the white and blue Ming vases, which the Dutch copied as Delft Blue Earthenware, in which are why we call porcelain China in English. The Ming Dynasty is by many Han Chinese considered the high watermark of imperial culture, art, poetry, and so on. The Ming built most of the Great Wall and the Forbidden City, the center of government in Beijing. But in the end, they lost their mandate as well and were removed by the Qing Dynasty, which was Manchu. So this is how Pu Yi, a Manchu and the last Qing Emperor, spent his youth in the Forbidden City in Beijing. Now these different groups are color-coded and you can see it actually in the movie. The banner of the Manchurian Qing dynasty shows a dragon on a yellow field. When the Republic is declared, the flag changes to one with five bands. The yellow still refers to the Manchu. 
the whites for the Tibetans, which you might remember when you think of the snow-capped peaks of the Tibetan plateau. Black is for the Muslims. It helps me to think of the black flags of the Shahada, the Islamic declaration of their faith. Also, pan-Arab flags have four colors, white, black, red and green, associated with the different caliphates, and there the black refers to the first caliphate, founded by the Prophet. The blue band refers to the Mongols. Like other people of the central Eurasian steppes, they traditionally worship the god of the big blue sky over the steppes, Tengri. You can see this blue also in other central Eurasian flags, such as that of Kazakhstan or the current flag of Mongolia. Red is for the Han. In Chinese culture, red also refers to good fortune. You can see this in the movie when Pu Yi gets married. The Forbidden City is dressed up in red, with big banners showing the double happiness character for marital bliss. The envelopes of money that Chinese people give to each other for the Lunar New Year are also red. And red symbolizes progress, and you can see this in the movie as well, in a brief shot near the end. There's a traffic light, and people are standing still in front of it when it's green. When it changes to red, people start moving. Mm -hmm. I also saw this symbolism myself when I visited China. I went to a research institute where on yeah. one of the walls they had a big project management chart. The projects that were completed were indicated with a red flag, which is the exact opposite of what we would do in the West, where a red flag means a problem or danger or blood. So the red of the communist flags has different connotations in Chinese culture. Now within this setting, this complex cultural setting with shifting balances between different groups and dynasties, Foreign colonial power started intruding from the long Chinese coast during a century of humiliation that looms large in Chinese memory. All the way to the south, in the tropical part of China, the British had forced their way in as a result of the First Opium War and had set up shop in Hong Kong, events described in a Footnote in History podcast. <laughs> Going north, the coast then forms a long arc, next to which lies the island of Taiwan. Fought over by the Dutch and the Portuguese, it has functioned several times as the last stand of the previous regime. The last Ming were on Taiwan, and now it's a country founded as the last refuge of the Kuomintang in the civil war with the communists. Further no north along the coast lies Shanghai, one of the cities in which Western powers obtained so-called concessions, bits of land where they set up trading posts. You can still see this in the cityscape. Van de Siecle European architecture on the bank of the Huangpu River is dwarfed by the futuristic high-rises of the new skyline on the other bank. Going still further north, we end up in the large-scale geography where much of the trouble in the movie takes place. This is the northeast of China, where Beijing lies, not too far from a large bay. The northern entrance to the bay is the Liaodong Peninsula. This is from where the Qing first started expanding in the 1600s. It's also where a war between China and Japan took place in 1894-95, resulting in the loss of the peninsula to Japan. However, they couldn't keep it, because when a triple intervention of France, Germany and Russia got together, they handed parts of the peninsula over to the Tsar. Ten years later, it was Russia's turn to be humiliated right there, when they lost Port Arthur to the Japanese, setting the stage for the revolutionary rumblings in Russia in 1905. Fast forward another 25 years, and it's the place from where the Japanese invade Manchuria. They install Puyi there in a farcical retake of his imperial rule. It's an act of treason that lands him in a communist re-education camp after the war. It is there that he writes his confession and self-criticism. It then takes a few rounds of editing to make it readable, but it becomes part of the basis for the movie. When Puyi is sufficiently re-educated, he is set free to become a peasant gardener. In a twist by the end of the movie, he appears to show a kind of Stockholm syndrome when he speaks up for one of his prison guards during a struggle session of the Cultural Revolution. We're not sure if the remodeling into a revolutionary citizen has Im impacted him throughout though, because one scene later, he still declares himself the former emperor of China in an intimate scene with a little pioneer kid inside the Forbidden City. Mm. It looks like his spirit has yes, actually still yes. survived. Kind of like the talent for playing the balalaika <laughs> in Zhivago's daughter. Yeah. Mm. Oh, nice, so there nice we are. tie in. That was, no, I like that. That was good. I like that. Yeah. I actually think these, I mean, outside of the whole uh, tie into, you know, the revolution theme, like one of the good things that ties it together is it's a different kind of survival story, right? Like he mm -hmm. doesn't realize he's just surviving. 
<laughs> until that moment. Well, he well when he, once he like, sees that car, know, it's, I mean, right. Once they, they show him what's happening outside, because when he's little, he really only knows the world that he's in. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And yeah, when he, when he's little, but it's, it's yeah. pretty amazing how clever and opportunistic wow. he still, he wow. still was, or what's yeah. kind of survival mm-hmm. instinct, he, because he was raised in the totally right, infantile setting with, you know, the, the poo sniffing really and all the rest. The and then there, there, there had been like, mm. you know, 20 different uh, occasions where he could have got right. the bullet mm-hmm. right there, right? The, in right. the first revolution and the second yeah. on the Japanese mm-hmm. after the war, and he makes it all the way through. Mm-hmm. I amazing. really love the scene where they first show him what's mm-hmm. outside. And he's like mind blown that mm-hmm. he's not actually the mm-hmm. emperor of everything. Mm-hmm. you know as a kid yeah, because yeah. you could just imagine the enormity of that right basically your whole life has been people protecting you and catering to you mm-hmm. and you're the most important person mm-hmm. to ever exist on the planet mm-hmm. at the time and all of a sudden you find out you're not actually in charge of anybody outside your own walls mm-hmm. like that to me was such yeah. a great Easy. depiction of how, how hard that would be to hit a kid who's mm-hmm. always been raised to be the most important thing in the place kind of him being imprisoned in the, in the castle and uh, oblivious to uh, the hardships of life it's uh, kind of like uh, the story of uh, siddhartha who, uh, before becoming buddha he was mm. raised in a castle and then mm-hmm. comes out and then like oh outside there are some uh, things happening i guess they reacted mm-hmm. uh, a little bit differently but uh, uh to you so so you think that this movie kind of positively portrays china because no. I think so. Okay. I think so, actually. So uh, state your case. It's true. It's true that nobody comes out looking great. But I think you also have to consider the time in which it is made, because so 1987 was yeah. the time of Deng Xiaoping and the time when we in the West thought, oh, there's Glasnost, there's Perestroika, maybe China goes that same kind of way. You know, uh, 1989, the uh, Tiananmen Square hadn't happened. Right. Well, that's so it. we thought. Well, yeah. maybe China is going to soften up as well. And and from the perspective of like Deng, Mao had some flaws. So, <laughs> so for example, in kind of the same way that after Stalin, Khrushchev had did the destalinization, well, Deng did a little bit of demaoization. And so, for example, yeah. they they actually did admit. Well, maybe the Cultural Revolution was a bit of an oopsie. Right, and <laughs> and so then in the way it's it's depicted in the movie, it's also okay. It it doesn't look great, but also it doesn't look terrible. Like okay, the Cultural Revolution, I mm-hmm. guess it's the main torture is with with accordions, I suppose, and there's some singing and dancing in the street. It's not <laughs> terrible. The re-education camp is also okay. Mm. If it was no a youth hostel, I'd be pretty upset, but it wasn't the worst. And like in and during that time period, like from the fifties to the sixties, first in the Great Leap Forward, like twenty to fifty million people died, and in the Cultural mm-hmm. Revolution, as well, you don't you don't see any of that. I see what you mean? So it's actually pretty friendly, all in all, to the system. And by the way, so at no time in mm. the whole thing, right. the the word Mao is ever like that name never comes up. No, yeah, that's kind of incredible. Right. Kind of like a symbolism. I have like a, the, the the symbolism of the colors in mind, and uh, Christine and Elizabeth tell me tell me what you think. Like so, when the movie starts, everything is colorful and looks happy, mm-hmm. and the communists are like gray and drab, and they're always mm-hmm. like uh, sullen or or angry, and kind of without even saying anything. I feel like um, I don't like those. I don't I don't like them. I don't like them. Mm-hmm. Everything they have to sing along everything. Yeah, but, but but the camp, you also have to see the perspective that that re-education camp from the Chinese perspective is like Spandau prison in, in Berlin or something like, okay, here, here's the worst of the worst, who we lo- it, it can, it can yes. be a little unpleasant, yes. there. that's fine. I'm, right? I'm just saying that this is, I'm just saying that this is what the movie shows, just like contrasts. Right, right. Stylistically, it does contrast the movie it. is yeah. showing that everything was beautiful and glittering. I think also it's important that... um. He lives, right? Like, they don't kill him. This isn't the Russian Revolution mm-hmm. where the Tsar yeah. and his family are brought into the basement. That's such a cool thing. This is, and it's true, right? That they kept him alive and he just dies as an old man. And so it's this very, and he he gets an arc. So I know, um, Rutger, that you were saying that you're not quite sure that he buys into the revolution because he says at the end, like, oh, hey, I'm the former emperor. Um but he does get sort of a nuanced arc that maybe some of our figures haven't gotten. Mm. Like, I know with the Patriot, Mel Gibson, oh, he doesn't want to fight and then he has All to right. fight. Um, 
but he he had it like there wasn't really that much nuance like he struggled between these ideas and then he kind of loses mm. it and he does this and then Les Mis it was the students and they're leading this and again they're going into it and they know they're not going to live and Russian Revolution we do it from the point of Dr. Zhivago who as we said is kind of static he doesn't really change a lot and then in this one we have the figure who goes from absolute infant like everybody caters to me I am literally the emperor to I am just another worker in our country it's just this very interesting evolution that this one lets us play out a little differently than I think any of the other movies have all right, but, but here exactly this is also what Mao uh, didn't want to do, right? They specifically kept him alive to show that the Chinese communist system was superior to the Russian system because we can actually mm -hmm. re-educate some, uh, re right. somebody right. and then right. they live the rest of their life happily uh, gardening. See, right. see how much better mm -hmm. uh, this is. Yeah. yeah. Because you think about it and like how long the mentality was, we mm -hmm. have to obliterate anybody who could possibly be a rallying point for people who object to what we're doing. You know, you even right. get, like, even in, not in Les Mis, but, like, the original French Revolution, when they just, like, mm -hmm. get rid of the monarchy completely, well, as completely as they can. Mm -hmm. And you go back to the Middle Ages, where you have, like, Prince John, who becomes mm -hmm. King John, and then it's like, I'm going to get rid of my brother's kid. <laughs> mm -hmm. you, because people might like him. And there's just so many instances where you see that they feel like the only way to really win or assert themselves is to get rid of the person who could be the rallying point. And I... I don't think we have a lot of movie instances that depict the opposite. It's like, uh, mm -hmm. it's like Bin Laden also, kill Bin Laden. Yeah, but in this case also, he, he was no longer really a, a rallying point though, right? So the, the communists right. got into power in 1949 and his rule had yeah. ended, True. his, his mm -hmm. officially recognized mm -hmm. rule had ended in 1911 or so. And in the meantime, so much had happened. And he also, he had kind of made himself look terrible by right. going to rule Manchukuo mm. under the Japanese. So, so right. he was very unimpressive. And that's it, right? He's, he's a traitor. But they could have gotten mm. rid of him in 1911. He was unimpressive, but I, I have to say, like to imagine like his uh, Tinder yeah. profile, you can say I was an emperor. <laughs> that's, come on. And all the things right. that he did, he had a very, very interesting life. It's so, at the end, the contrast is so powerful right. when he's there mm -hmm. in the Forbidden City, uh, this person, and, he, and, and only then I, I personally like realized the magnitude of being an emperor. At first, like him, you take for granted the fact that he's an emperor, but only at the end, I'm like, wow, this guy was the Chinese right. emperor. It's just, mm -hmm. uh, it's not an achievement. Yeah. But <laughs> it's know. interesting to see how a person looks yeah. when you strip it all away. You know, and it's, he just becomes yeah. like, he could literally yeah. just be some guy on the street and you would not really, not really know wow. out of context, right? What that does to people. Yeah. But it, it hadn't struck me um, yeah, the way that we talked about when like all the other movies were made, like Dr. Zhivago is made in the mid in the Cold War in the 1960s. Right. But I, I hadn't occurred to me that it was 1987. So two years before Tiananmen, like a decade after Nixon goes to China type thing like that's a really interesting like background idea of how this movie yeah. was made and how it would be seen as a positive to say hey let's make a movie about the last emperor who the chinese like magnanimously let live right they re-educate him and they give him things or they you know mm -hmm. not give him things but they basically yeah they you know and so that's really fascinating as some sort of potential piece of propaganda that was happening they also tried to educate mm -hmm. him like if you go to the toilet at night <laughs> You have to piece <laughs> yeah, inside piece of the balls. This is something I, I have a daughter, but if I had I had a son, I would have told her that I guess when he was uh, very young. So in that sense, to your point, like they were actually mm -hmm. helping him, like giving him basic tools right. to live. You can't be an emperor yeah. anymore. Right. You can't be a traitor anymore. So you have to learn something. And, and, and how would that movie? be made today first of all it would be mm -hmm. chinese movie like if there was e ever a movie like that it would be yeah. produced written by china or financed by china because we know now that the politics are not, we don't know now but let's say prior to covid 19 uh, the chinese uh, have uh, like the last say on a lot of uh, movies by financing mm -hmm. them and in, with the nba they had all this trouble and also with the english premier league the football league the soccer league whatever there they are very, very, very touchy about everything that could be perceived as criticism. And Rutger, uh, you were talking about 
how maybe the communist uh, party you told me that uh, off air could be seen as uh, you know the next evolution of uh, of the mm -hmm. dynasties that preceded it so, you want to elaborate a little bit well sure well uh, i uh, exactly i think so what's interesting about these dynasties again that they're not necessarily like uh, blue b blue blooded rulers who think now it's my turn to be the king sometimes these were sort of commoners that that rose up because they thought well it's time to establish mm -hmm. a new order so in that sense mao is is just the next kind of mm -hmm. emperor mm -hmm. in that tradition mm -hmm. Do you want to maybe, do you have like a look, an overarching look of those two episodes, those four movies, those four revolution? Any thoughts uh, about that? Well, actually, I had one thing I want to say about, about The Last Emperor, because I, like I had told you guys, uh, it was the only one that I had never seen or engaged with in any way before. So I told myself when I was watching it that I was not going to look anything up until afterwards, because I just wanted to see it as a movie. And I broke my own rule in like 15 minutes and started looking things up, but that's besides the point. Um, <laughs> I, but before I realized that it was actually based on things that he wrote about his own life, um, I thought, then I thought, oh my God, are we really watching this movie where they bring in this like Scottish dude and he's supposed to be like our like Western gateway into this Chinese, they think we're like so stupid that we need to see somebody Western come in to see this because we really don't. And so I'm like Googling it, like what is going on here? And I'm learning, looking at it and going, oh my gosh, like that really happened. Mm -hmm. Like imagine being that guy mm -hmm. who is like, oh, this is yeah. what I did. Like that to me as somebody who admittedly did not know that that happened, was, felt like it was going to be like a film device mm -hmm. and then i was like oh my gosh mm -hmm. it's one of those moments you go oh no that's really what how yeah. it went and i liked that they didn't add it as a film device that it was a mm -hmm. real thing yes you know yes. it was really it made it feel less forced mm -hmm. because there are so many times when you watch these mm -hmm. historical movies where they think that they need to insert something in order to make it um, identifiable to whoever their primary audience is intended mm -hmm. to be Right, so here as a framing device, it could have been his book. Right, so right, that's, yeah. right, of course, exactly. Yeah. So I was like on guard mm. to be like annoyed yeah. um, <laughs> about how Just we ready didn't to be need annoyed. this. <laughs> I was ready to be annoyed. I'm always ready to be annoyed. And <laughs> then I was realizing it and going, oh, okay, I give it a pass. That's really kind of mm -hmm. cool. Um, but then I was just thinking about the way in which that education was important to him. Um, because he, he really kind of enjoys this education that he gets mm -hmm. and, uh, and having two wives also <laughs> kind of enjoys well, it. Yeah, that. he does. But, but the Western uh, education, I mean, mm -hmm. that doesn't, that happen with a lot of like, uh, uh, kings and princes mm -hmm. and so on. Oh, well, let's spend a year in Oxford or mm -hmm. whatever. And right, kind of, right, right. Not only that, of also course. Bashar Assad also uh, was, uh, exactly. educated yeah. uh, in the West. Though he's very, very progressive, right? Everything is open, but you can't divorce me. Come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, don't be no, silly. I thought that was. I thought the wives were really interesting <laughs> mm -hmm. too, because I didn't know. I mean, I I vaguely kind of knew who who he was, but I didn't know the details of of you know what was going on, and especially I did not know about his wives. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I, I was fascinated that the one of them just yep. leaves. Yeah, she's just like I don't yeah. want to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. What did she do? Yeah, I don't know. What like the like the, like the like all of them no no one of them has like any life skills uh, yeah. marketable like, skills where do you go something yeah where would you go the, the, who would you be you must be really fed up to just wow, choose to go off really? when you really have nothing waiting for you so i i think she so she went on to live her life and i think she got remarried or something mm -hmm. like that and then when she passed away she was she was buried and then much much later there was reburials of some of the mm -hmm. imperial family uh, and a bit more stately but not her because oh. she had divorced so she <laughs> gave <laughs> the family she, she, gave <laughs> so up she was left, right. left in that's just a common grave yeah. that, that that's she, fine yeah, yeah that's that's fine. Fine. the interpersonal relationships yeah. were really interesting I mean, when the, the scene where he finds out that his other wife is pregnant by somebody else mm -hmm. and, and then what they do to that. Oh, my God. It was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that also really happened, yeah, right? Yeah. And she and she that the, the opium mm -hmm. addiction was really because mm -hmm. of right. that. Uh, I mean, and you can imagine yeah. why. 
And how so about the Forbidden yeah. City? Just like seeing everything in the mm-hmm. Forbidden City, like if you've been there, it's like totally empty and just like mm-hmm. seeing it. So it's I would uh, love to see it. There's something missing there. And I don't know, it's kind of it's kind of symbolic in many ways to what the communists have done to to China, to Chinese culture that preceded it. So there you see it come to life. It's just uh, fascinating right. seeing mm-hmm. all the people walking around him and wherever he goes, he stops. They can't look him in the right. eye, all kinds of like weir- the weirdest things. How was he ever a normal right. person? Oh, but there was also really, really good uh, communist propaganda mm-hmm. in some mm-hmm. way. I mean, like the court is displayed as just very servile and just with all the silly mm-hmm. costumes and the kowtowing. Yeah, and, and like the wet nurse, way too right. old uh, still and all that's like, that's, that's all perfect. Like, okay, this order needs to go because this is just idiotic right. and decadent and it's yeah. time for something new. So, so also like what, what's interesting, what they say about the movie is that they say, well, and we had completely free hands to, uh, to film this and oh my gosh, uh, the Chinese of 1987 were very permissive. But I think that yeah. on the ch- from the Chinese perspective, they probably also were pretty confident that this was going to be fine because uh, Bernardo Bertolucci is, is a, a Marxist who had previously worked with uh, Pasolini and he'd made uh, Novecento. So he had already made a super, super long movie about peasant life in Italy. And he was probably going to say the right thing. So they didn't have to worry too much. And indeed, he did say basically what, what they kind of hoped w- would be said, I think. And it was probably from the PR perspective better to just let him do it and not interfere at all than make it seem like, oh, this is a very heavily uh, scripted and edited mm-hmm. movie. So from their mm-hmm. perspective, they did mm-hmm. they did the perfect job of getting this movie done by a Westerner, mm-hmm. staying on message and making something mm-hmm. visually like appealing. Two, two quick points. The blue sky in the Forbidden City, uh, when I was there almost 20 years ago, there was, there was no more <laughs> yeah. blue sky. So that's also something uh, of a historical relic. But your point, I don't remember them, the, the movie saying anything negative about the, the Republic. No, but that's also true because Sun Yat-sen is uh, actually revered both by the People's Republic and by Taiwan. So that's why they also, so first Sun Yat-sen kind of comes in to, to found the Republic, but very quickly he makes room for Yuan Shikai, who is actually kind of the last emperor because he, he becomes first the president and he becomes more and more dictatorial and decides, no, 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 I'm not going to be the emperor. Um, but nobody liked that. <laughs> so, and then he, he died like a, within a year or something like that. And that's when actually the whole thing also broke up into these different warlords. Uh, so Puyi is not really the last emperor, but at least the last dynastic right. emperor. And then this other guy who comes in, who you see briefly in the movie, he's the one that's riding around in the uh, uh, limousine with the open top, like, oh, this is the president right. of the Republic. Well, that's the, the guy you end because Sun Yat-sen again, like he's... Uh, totally accepted by the People's Republic as an improvement relative to the emperors before. So they like him on both sides of the tra- Strait of Japan. So there's also no talking smack mm-hmm. about him at all. Strait of China, maybe, no? Uh, the Taiwan, I, I suppose. I, the, I, I, well, you know, the, the People's Republic and the Republic of China. The Japanese-centric view of everything. They have the Sea of Japan, that the Koreans want to call the Sea of Korea, all kinds of uh, beefs. <laughs> the islands. I guess I misspoke. <laughs> we we always get mad emails from angry Japanese listeners. Oh, uh, so. yeah, God, yeah, know your obsessed. geography. So many Japanese listeners that are. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, but this is also the weird thing how it developed because at first, oh, I have an excellent anecdote. Sorry, just that I was going to insert that, and here we go. Okay, here. So I read insert it. here. here Splice. Cut. Okay. Ready. <laughs> so my great grandfather was a communist, and he was on a watch list <clears throat> of uh, the Dutch secret services. And in the same list, a couple pages down the line, is a guy called Henk Sneefleet. And he's, there's now a metro station near Amsterdam named after him. Henk Sneefleet was also a communist. And Henk Sneefleet, he went from Holland first to the then Dutch East Indies to help the independence movement there, to help found the Social Democratic Party there. And then he was, he be, he'd become a commentator and operative. And from there, he had then was then sent to uh, Shanghai to be present at the founding of the Communist Party of China, which actually happened what? in the in the French uh, in the French concession in Shanghai in a girls' school because they thought, well, that's kind of safe there. And so they founded the party there, and then Hank Snaefleet actually uh, advised Mao 
uh, what you really should be doing is continue to collaborate with the KMT to have this united front, right? And actually, so what's happened for a while in the history of China in the first half of the 20th century is that the nationalists and the communists work together first to try to unify China and, and then later also to try to get kick the Japanese out. So in this in this early history of China, sort of the uh, uh, Sun Yat-sen was in the KMT, later, okay, Chiang Kai-shek was an asshole, but part of this nationalist movement <laughs> was kind of acceptable from the communist perspective and they were working actually together to get yeah. uh, the foreign influences out of China and to get turn yeah. it more towards something that served the people. Yeah, and that also wasn't a given that the communists uh, would uh, come out on top. Uh, Not at all. After the Not civil at all. war, no, they still mm -hmm. have to do the long march and all that stuff. Long uh, march, yeah. Oh, I want to, yeah. I want to see a movie about uh, about the long march, and I want to see a movie about Napoleon. I want like a ten part series in on Netflix or HBO about Napoleon. Why is there not Napole not a good Napoleon movie or a series? Uh, so. not a movie. I want to, yeah, like ten. Ten parts. Because I can't come up with somebody who would play him in a way that I would appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> I think about this all the time. All the time. Because I just feel like I would pick everything apart. No, but you uh, can find like a powerful uh, French actor that has this charisma. But so did you see that documentary about Napoleon an actor though? I think that's on Netflix. That's like the guy playing Napoleon. No, but now I want to. There's actually so there's a whole guild of people playing Napoleon and reenacting for Waterloo and so on, <laughs> and then there's the one guy who supposedly looks the most like him, like he's the, num oh, the number one. Oh, now I need Napoleon. to see that. Yeah. It sounds yeah, like my like pretty good. ideal yeah. thing to watch. Yeah, yeah it's, it's pretty good. He's French. Oh man. <laughs> no, it's uh, he, he's English, so that's also kind of unacceptable <laughs> to the French reenactors. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that should just discredit him immediately. He's like, I don't care. I think he was English, but speaks French really well, something like that. But then still, he's. But the movie, the movie is English or the movie is French? Yeah, it's it's a it was well, a documentary. I don't know. I think it's English. Imagine being the English guy whose like whole life is playing like Napoleon. That would be just an amazing sort of mental disconnect. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. But how did you get there? What, what in life happened? What happened to you in life that brought you to this place? Oh, so gosh. random. Yeah. If they did a, a Napoleon, the Napoleon biopic, I, I, I don't know if I, I would have a hard time because I, I just would pick it apart and I like want to see it, but I also feel like I'm not sure <laughs> how it would go over for me. Mm. I, I, Wouldn't it be like a, like Rome, like the first season of Rome? With Julius Caesar. Okay, just, I love Rome. It was wonderful. Rome was I wonderful. want something like that. Mm. That's what I want. Wonderful. I could do that. That I could. Mm. I could see that. I would watch that. I, I pity Liz for the text that she would get as I was watching it. <laughs> well, I was just about to say that that I would take screenshots of the text messages and just put them on Twitter and just be like, "Here we go, people." She's going in. This is what I'm receiving. <laughs> so I feel like. Uh, these movies are very different from one another now that uh, I'm thinking about the whole thing. The yeah. first was a national revolution. We didn't mention yeah. that. Mm -hmm. The first revolution, the American Revolution, is a national revolution, yes. right? It's not, it's mm -hmm. not class-based at all, which says something about the time uh, that it happened, though mm -hmm. right. not much later, the, the French Revolution is again, like the Marxist reading of uh, the French Revolution is that it was a liberal uh, revolution for the, for the middle class. And then the Russian Revolution, that's more like uh, for the, mm -hmm. the masses. So there is kind of, a, of an arc there. And the Chinese Revolution well, is kind of a, a lot of things together. Both yeah, things I, I, spo together. I suppose that, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the communists might make the distinction that uh, the Russian Revolution was more uh, for the industrial proletariat, whereas the Maoist Revolution was more the peasant class on the countryside. I mean, that's, that's just like the narrative that they stuck to. I don't know if that, that's yeah. actually meaningful in any way, but that's the distinction that, that's then being made. I think we unintentionally did a really good job at picking movies that show different aspects intentionally, intentionally. of revolution because when we were talking about this was a totally oh, yeah. planned. people are listening <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is, yeah hey guys people who are listening i put uh -oh. in 1776 not the patriot but whatever it's fine <laughs> that's true you did you did put in that which is another really great movie a great i don't know why because it's a musical <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but I cut you off, Christine. No, no, it's just because saying how awesome we are. Well, yeah, I was. On. Well, because our conversation was really like, okay, what movies have you seen? 
what movies would you like to talk about and how do we cover different regions of the world more so than how do you cover different aspects of what a revolution is and who it touches um and i i think just based on the way it came together one of the things that i noticed which i wouldn't have been paying as much attention to if it had been intentional uh, was that we hit so many different perspectives on what a revolution is and how the the era in which the story was created because they weren't all autobiographies obviously influences the way the story is then told on the screen um which i had not expected to think right. about when i started right, right. even the last emperor yeah. is the story of the deposed the deposed monarch slash king even we have that right. in the revolution the guy who lost everything mm -hmm. right you have the guy who lost everything you have you know the the revolution that doesn't actually take off mm -hmm. in lame is mm -hmm. you have the patriot which is the people who are trying to get rid of the king and and he loses i mean he loses his sons in the patriot but he right. doesn't like lose any political power or right right and then dr Zhivago, you have the people who are kind of trying to get through when the revolution happens to them mm. so you really are looking at the fact that a revolution whether you want it to or not is going to touch all levels of society yeah. um and that that happens no matter where you are in the world. Boom. I mean, every revolution looks different, but every revolution has some aspects of it that are the same. Like we yeah. said, there's no such thing really as a clean revolution, right? Even mm -hmm. when you talk about the glorious revolution in, in England. That was the best one still, though, for sure. Well, well right, but it's still like, <laughs> it's still not perfect, right? Our, so you would you would say that's your favorite revolution, but anyway. <laughs> is that your favorite this, this, this is my favorite revolution, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Can you please rank your top 10 revolutions right now? <laughs> they, the they do not revolution? have to be successful. Well, number two would be Velvet Revolution. I have to agree with that, that, that was nice. Yeah, Revolution. Yeah. That was a nice one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, I liked the way that it was unintentionally um, tying together all these different ways because it was easier to make segues than I anticipated it being mm -hmm. and to tie them together because there were aspects that overlapped, mm -hmm. even ones that we probably didn't touch because, mm -hmm. you know, you could go on and yeah, movies yeah, for yeah. a couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I have all these notes. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to do with them. <laughs> I know. I have like a whole, like four pages of notes from watching the yeah, movies yeah, yeah. and then like all the stuff that i was looking up and you go you know well when they do a musical of the last emperor we'll come back and revisit it. <laughs> <laughs> i kept texting liz and saying i'm gonna keep trying to not talk about musicals but it's not gonna happen no no keep going keep going <laughs> that has been a lot of fun for me it was fun yeah, i enjoyed this was it too very fun yep I think yeah. our listeners are going to be like what is going on this is so different <laughs> and i We're hope that they it love experimental. it experimental yeah, for Our us, it's also experimental. experimental yeah. episode. Yeah, I'm sure. But it was fun, which is nice. I hope it's fun for people to listen to. Because it's fun I mean, for us. I'm I'm always delightful, so I'm sure it's fun whenever anyone well, listens to me. I know. People are, people are going to say, like, wow, that girl Christine, she needs to go back on a script. <laughs> <laughs> if you're interested in owning some Footnoting History merch including our masks, you can find out more through our shop link at www.footnotinghistory.com. Want to support the show and keep it open access? Our Patreon is at patreon.com forward slash footnoting underscore history. You can also follow us on Twitter at History Footnote or on Facebook and Instagram as Footnoting History. And of course, the best stories are always in the footnotes. <laughs>